I just want to say three quick things before we do Q&A. First, and I'm not really sure exactly why, but for some, uh, for some strange reason, I'm feeling a lot less accomplished <laughs> <laughs> with my life. Um, the second thing is I remember the name of that fourth organization that one of our uh, social entrepreneurship teams is going to partner with, and it speaks directly to what Ryan just said about the essence of a Malvern education. The fourth organization is the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, and that team of students is going up to New York City next week to meet with their chief medical officer. They've designed an app that targets um, at-risk adolescents, but what they call upstream at-risk adolescents, meaning kids who are maybe prone to depression or anxiety but haven't shown any symptoms yet. Uh, they may have difficult family situations or social situations, uh, but they're far away from any sort of suicidal ideation or or behaviors. But of course, that's exactly the group that needs the most attention uh, because they're typically invisible to most of us. Uh, and I had the good fortune of being up at the AFSP a couple of weeks ago with the, uh, the mentor for this team of Malvern students who knows the chief medical officer there. And she said, you know, uh, for all the great work that the AFSP does, she said, we don't actually have a partnership with a single school. And she, she said, it wasn't until Malvern reached out to me that I said, how is that possible? That the most vulnerable population is a population that we haven't even really tried to address. And when she heard about the app that these students were designing and, uh, and creating a paper prototype for, she said, well, could we partner with you guys? Could you guys bring in our content and our resources? Uh, so that's no guarantee that the partnership will necessarily uh, become concrete, but certainly in this early stage, there's this opportunity for our, our students to have a material impact on the well-being, on, literally on the lives of people who are at risk of suicide. If that is not an expression of what you see up here, I don't know what is. And when I think about the purpose of a Malvern education uh, or of any other Catholic education, I think one way of thinking about it is we are trying to help our young men learn what it means in a real, concrete, and experiential way, not just in an abstract or theoretical way, but in an experiential way what it means to put your hands in, get them dirty, in building the kingdom of God. That can sound really abstract. That can sound really kind of uh, theoretical or ethereal. It can sound like something that you hear in church maybe on Sundays. Um, but I'm pretty sure that when Jesus said it a couple thousand years ago, he was talking about this moment and the next moment and the next moment. And that's what our students are doing. And the third and final thing I'll say before taking Q&A is that, again, I couldn't have planned this. I had literally had no idea it was going to happen uh, today. But I, I had a couple of guests visiting campus from, uh, from Camden Catholic, as a matter of fact. They were here to see what we do with our learning commons, with our uh, innovative learning programs. And so uh, without having planned it, I said, well, you know, let's go take a look at the middle school learning commons. And we walked into the middle school learning commons. And what do I see? Uh, but the middle school faculty and middle school students surrounded by students and faculty from Hope Partnership in Philadelphia. And if you know anything about Hope Partnership, you know that they serve at-risk, low-income students from the city of Philadelphia. And they're basically giving these kids a fighting chance at not just a great middle school education, but a chance to get into a great high school and a great college and to have a life that's different from the one that they've grown up, a better life. Uh, and I couldn't be more proud that Malvern uh, teachers and students are giving what they can of themselves to help HOPE's teachers and HOPE's students have a better learning experience. But just as importantly, and Ryan said this, and I hope you, I hope you heard it, um, the experience that our teachers and our students take away from those interactions will enable, will enrich our students and our teachers' lives and will enable them to be better, more creative, and more um, kind of mission-driven problem solvers. That is that's what we're about. That's why we're here. Anyway, um, thank you for your attention during the presentation portion. And, uh, and now we'll open up the floor to questions. And uh, I don't know if we're going to get any questions from our online audience, but I know that there's the opportunity for people to submit questions there as well.
So what's on your mind? What can we, what we can we clarify or elaborate for you? Yes. The question is, how is the block scheduling going? Um, I would say it's been uh, a mixed success, definitely more of a success than not. Uh, the things that have been successful have been the opportunities to learn, obviously in blocks of time as opposed to uh, much smaller and kind of uh, uniformed uh, increments of time. It used to be that uh, classes were about 45 minutes, give or take, each. And when you take in transit time and the, the time it takes for kids to get settled in and get their heads in the right space, you're really talking about more like 30, 35 minutes. Um, and that's not a lot of time to pick up speed and, and get things done. Uh, with the modified block schedule with 60 to 80 minute blocks of time, uh, there's far more opportunity to do uh, deeper dives and to do collaborative learning. Um, and I think most of our teachers, if not all of them, would say that that part of it has been a great success. Um, I know teaching, uh, or, or in helping to teach, I should say, the, the social entrepreneurship class, we need those blocks of time for those kids to, to build enough steam up um, as, they, as they work on their projects. Uh, and Ryan mentioned that, and everybody here knows if, you, if you're in the workforce, that uh, typically you work in teams and you, you, you have meetings or you have um, brainstorms or you have work sessions that last uh, for a lot longer than typically 45 minutes or so. Um, that doesn't mean that a 60 or 80 minute block is a replication of reality, but it, it better approximates um, both what they'll face in college and in the real world. So I, I would say that that's been a success. I would also say, um, from what I've observed and from what I've heard, that the reduced number, just the sheer quantity of classes per day, um, reduces some of the, the burden when it comes to homework. Um, there's really no correlation. Uh, many studies have shown there's really no correlation between the, the quantity of homework and the quality of student learning uh, or student outcomes when it comes to standardized tests. So uh, it's good. It's a good thing if students are using the, uh, the unstructured day time they have during the day, uh, if they're using their study hall periods, and if they have fewer overall subjects for homework in any given night, it's a good thing if they're not spending three, four, five hours uh, doing homework. So I would say that, that there's been a, a slight decrease in that, in that pressure on students. I think one of the things that's been difficult is the, the fact that um, in, a, in an eight-day cycle, we meet five days for a, a full credit class. Uh, and if there's some day that drops off because it's a snow day or a holiday or, or some other reason, um, the, there can be some discontinuity, and I think that the starting and stopping can sometimes be very difficult uh, for both teachers and students. Uh, and I also think that uh, for the very same reason, um, you know, if you're teaching two sections of, of English and um, one of those sections has a 60 minute period today and uh, the, the same, the, you know, a different section of the same class has the 80 minute period today, um, but for some reason there's a variation in our schedule, it just throws things out of whack. Um, and I think that can be difficult to just kind of balance, uh, balance out. But the good news is that um, we, have, we have these teams of, of faculty and staff working on lots of different things like this. Uh, there is a team that is devoted to nothing but fine-tuning our modified block schedule. Um, and I think they're approaching a kind of final set of proposals for the faculty and, and staff to react to, really more the faculty than the staff. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing them pitch their ideas for uh, an upgraded and fine-tuned version of the modified block. Yeah. Sure, so the question is, um, we talked a little bit about emerging partnerships with different organizations for our current students, and as these students graduate, what might those partnerships look like as those students enter college and, and beyond? One thing I didn't talk about is, um, is the, the whole other set of non-academic experiential learning opportunities that students have, and I'll, I'll pause just for one moment to, uh, to make a plug for something that you got an email about, uh, which is our spring distinguished speaker, Dr. Samil uh, Aladin from, from Finland, uh, who's done a, a, a kind of a groundbreaking research study in Finland on brand bullying, so the way in which uh, adolescents use 
brands that they purchase, whether it's clothing or, or otherwise, um, to kind of create social and negative social and peer pressure. Uh, Dr. Aladdin is coming here to the United States. He's going to do some additional research here to extend his findings. He's asked to talk with Malvern students and Villa Maria students. Uh, and he's also going to present his findings to, to you in early April. Um, and students who want to participate anonymously can do that through uh, a survey in which their, their, their ID will just be a, a four-digit number. Um, but for those students who want to go a step further and, and share more personal experiences, um, they can opt into that as well. And um, we're going to design a project-based learning experience around that. So just as we uh, have done with our previous uh, distinguished speakers up to this point, um, we're going to present an opportunity for Malvern students to work on some project that would demonstrate their understanding of what bullying means. And there will be another opportunity to, to create a, a project that demonstrates their understanding of what brands are and, and developing a, a keener awareness uh, that when they make a, a decision, a purchase decision, uh, or even when they get dressed in the morning, uh, what, you know, what, what does a brand mean and, and how does that affect their decision making, which is something that most of us don't think about in, and especially adolescents. So to get back to Julie's question, what do these partnerships mean as students going to college and beyond? Well, it's going to vary, I think, from student to student, but one of the great opportunities that students have now is to develop relationships. So I'll use the social entrepreneurship class as an example. Um, the kids who are working with City Team, which is a, a nonprofit organization in Chester that serves the homeless, um, they are in personal contact with the executive director. So they email him, they call him, they visited twice. Uh, this is not a um, this is not a depersonalized set of interactions. This is a highly personal interaction with that executive director and his team. Uh, the team that's going to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, they are having individual conversations with the chief medical officer. The team that was at KIND uh, Inc. today, they had a one hour meeting with the president of that company, uh, so on and so forth. So it's not just the, uh, the intellectual learning that's taking place. These kids are learning things like, when you send an email to the president of the company, you better make sure that the subject line catches his attention. You better make sure that the email is as, is as concise as possible. You better make sure that if he says, call me at 3 o'clock, that you are calling at 2.59 and 59 seconds. Um, and when you have the opportunity to spend that time with that person, make the personal connection, follow up with a thank you note. Um, all the things that we, we know kind of go into the, the long-term relationships that we have with business partners so that down the road, you may have an opportunity to provide more value to that person. You may be in a position to ask a favor of that person. You may be in a position to connect that person with somebody else. Um, so I think a lot of it is going to vary, but what I've seen very much in the social entrepreneurship class, what I've seen our middle school students doing with their uh, multiple partnerships with local organizations is develop those um, those relationships with people that um, you know maybe don't uh, necessarily result in any concrete uh, partnership now, although often they do. Um, but that will have long-term consequences for where they go to college, um, what internships they get during the summer, uh, what jobs they may be um, uh, they may be seeking and, and uh, finding after college. So I have a hard time saying anything more concrete than that, but there is a kind of an intentional approach um, with our students in developing that. Yeah. Uh, well, I would say we're trying to figure it out insofar as the work that the guys are doing now will probably terminate in terms of the, of the academic year, you know, by the time May rolls around, um, when they're done with the class, their work will terminate at the prototype phase. And then it will really be up to them to decide, well, 
this probably could take off. If we kept running with this, we can test it out. And so, you know, for example, Kind, I'll use them as the example, they are going to donate a significant quantity of, of Kind bars to see if this experiment works. And if it does work, then you know that's going to go into the summer and maybe into the into the next year. Um, I can't speak to whether that would actually happen, but if it does, it, it's 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 definitely an opportunity that our students will have. And we have plenty of people in the Malvern community, members of our board of trustees, alumni who are you know uh, IP attorneys who can help them you know think through like if you're going to enter into a partner a real official formal business business partnership where you might have some skin in the game, um, these are the questions you should ask. You should really hire an attorney, those sorts of things. Um, our school year just doesn't go long enough for us to, to, to get that deep into it, but, but that's very much the kind of thing that we're already talking about with kids that, you know, if you want to keep doing this, you can, and here are some things that you'd want to, you'd want to think about. Yes? Uh, I'm Brian Swanick. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate my mountain brother, Eric. Really great speech. Very interesting. Thank you. What other questions do you have? And are there any that have come in online? Yeah. Yeah. Um, where is Great question. The question is, where is Malvern in designing for STEM or STEAM, as Ryan would, would want us to do? Um, so I mentioned that in October, we had a full one-day session with the University of Notre Dame's uh, Center for STEM Education, uh, and that included some uh, some local thought leaders and, and, and partners for us. And uh, I mentioned one team, one team internally that's focused on uh, fine-tuning our modified block schedule. Well, we have another two teams. One is focused on redesigning the ninth and 10th grade learning experience, and another that's focused on redesigning the 11th and 12th grade experience. These are still a couple years away in terms of, of execution, uh, but one of the questions that each of those teams needs to think about is uh, how do we integrate science, technology, engineering, and math and the arts uh, into a kind of coherent approach in the upper school. So uh, the middle school, which is led by Pat Sillip, uh, has had tremendous, extraordinary success in redesigning the sixth grade, which happened last year. This year, uh, both the sixth and the seventh grade have been redesigned. Next year, uh, that whole project will culminate in the eighth grade summit experience, and then the year after that will be the ninth and tenth grade redesign. And Pat is leading the ninth and tenth grade redesign team. That's a question that that team thinks about and talks about. Uh, and recently, that team uh, and Pat went out to High Tech High in San Diego and, and spent some time seeing how they do it. And and figuring out what good ideas do we want to steal from them, but also, you know, what are the things that are going to be unique to Malvern that uh, a school like High Tech High can't do, uh, which really gets back to our mission. Um, and Ron is leading, Ron Algio, the head of our upper school, is leading the 11th and 12th grade redesign team. Uh, so I don't want to speak for them, and I'm not sure uh, that there really is anything that's particularly concrete, but one of the great opportunities we have because of our very close relationship with the University of Notre Dame is this ongoing discussion, and we do hope to bring them back to campus to show them some early design get their reactions um, and their response as as leaders in, in STEM education. Yeah. How's the overall teacher buy academy model for the summer grade? Yeah, so the question is how is the overall teacher buy-in for the academy model? Um, I would say that uh, the middle, for the middle school, they, they've been thinking about it for so long now that it's just sort of a, a given for them. And the upper school, I think, has been thinking about it for, for just as long, but maybe in a different context, uh, which is to say that uh, because they knew that there was more time before it actually rolled up into the high school, um, they, they had the liberty of, of doing more experimentation and, and trying things out uh, without the pressure to do something systematically. Uh, 
so, you know, Mecca has been always been around as a, as a long-standing example of project-based learning. The social entrepreneurship class is new, but you know, we, we could probably spend the rest of the night with my go, going through a laundry list of places where individual teachers or departments um, or grade levels are experimenting with a different kind of, uh, of assessment or a different kind of lesson. And then there are also lots of things that are outside the classroom as well that are kind of blurring the lines between what it means to, to, to be a student. So, you know, one example I would give is, is the Blackfriar Chronicle, which has a student and its moderator here tonight, uh, has done increasingly impressive work with, uh, with their publication. And I would argue that the learning that they do, uh, both in the brainstorming to generate ideas for stories and the interviews that they conduct, the writing, the editing, the building of the actual physical newspaper, the maintenance of the website, uh, their conversations for ongoing professional development with, uh, with journalists, their participation in conferences. They're learning as much and arguably more than they would learn if they took um, you know, a kind of a, a, a journalism class. And actually some of them do take a journalism class which feeds into their work in the Blackfriar Chronicle. So there's that great synergy there too. Um, so I would say, you know, across the upper school, you would see varying levels of activity, but you would see a consistent commitment to the kind of approach that we're taking more systematically in the, in the middle school. Other questions? So one, one last thing, which is really just a reminder. On the website, I showed you a couple screenshots of that uh, by the numbers page. Uh, there will also be answers to questions that were submitted online in advance of tonight. Uh, I think we got maybe 14 or 15 questions. And so virtually everything we do internally as a faculty and staff uh, is done in, in teams. So you'll see responses from different teams uh, according to what question is being asked. Uh, but there will also specify, the, the, the page will specify who you can reach out to, what particular individual you can reach out to for more information um, if the answer either is um, incomplete or uh, it triggers another question for you. So I would encourage you to, to visit that site. And, and, and please give us feedback. We've never put that up before. Um, we do intend to, uh, to maintain that in an ongoing way so that it's not just once a year that you find out these really important facts and figures about Malvern. Um, so if there's anything that you really like about it, please let us know that so that we can keep doing it. And if there's anything that you think can be tweaked or done differently, please let us know that because uh, we are committed to constant improvement in that, in that regard. And I will end by saying thank you very much for coming out tonight. And if you tuned in online, thank you for, uh, for dialing in. And uh, we look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks.